Lord, we thank you for this morning. We open our hearts to you. We ask that you would speak to us, Father, and that we would be attentive to listen. Lord, we want to grow in our relationship with you, Lord. We want to press in. Um, We want to come to know you in a way that we have never before. So, Lord, we place ourselves before you this morning. And there are things this week um, perhaps we need to come to you and repent of, Lord. Uh, so, Jesus, we just we place these things before you. Um, each person here knows what that may be. Um, but, Lord, we, we come to you and we ask you just wash our feet uh, anew, Lord, so that the, the trash and whatever else got on us from walking about in the world this week, that would be washed away and we would be pleasing in your sight. Lord, we ask you to open your word to our hearts and open our hearts to your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so how many here have ever heard of hot rivet syndrome? That's not a new band. Although when I thought about that, that'd be an awesome band name, hot rivet syndrome. No, you've never heard of it because it's something that has been fixed. It's not an issue anymore. But back in the 1830s, when cowboys, I'm sorry, 70s, 1870s, when cowboys were wearing their Levi's out, and they'd come in off the range, and they would come and sit around a campfire. You know, Levi's back then were made with rivets. There's still some rivets on jeans, but they don't serve the purpose that they originally served. The rivets were originally placed on jeans to uh, secure the seams and to really hold those seams together. And so <laughs> there, there was one seam in particular um, that got a lot of uh, workout during the day, um, and so that seam was in the crotch, and, and it needed an extra rivet right there. And so when the cowboys would come in from the range, and they would be, uh, be you know, squatting down uh, next to the fire there, that rivet would heat up. And, and if you weren't paying attention, if you'd forgotten about it, as soon as you stood up, you realized your mistake. Well, that got changed. You know, obviously, we don't have that issue anymore. That got changed. The, uh, the, the vice president of Levi's went on a camping trip. The next day, there was a memo, right? New information can inspire people to change. Our, our theme over the past few weeks was that of impact. And our focus was really on impacting our communities, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, uh, even our families, but it was external. It was more external than it was internal. We had some, some back and forth regarding internal change. That's obviously important, but we're going to focus more on internal change in our chapter. Um, you know, it's great to make an impact for Christ on a broader scale, but unless we ourselves are willing to change as the Lord prunes us and refines us, then that impact that we make to the outside world is going to be much less than if we cooperate with the Lord in that pruning. You know, impact is a very interesting word. We, we've been using it over the past couple of weeks in a very positive way. You know, impact we've been using as a positive word. But if you go and look at that word in a thesaurus, most of the words, most of the synonyms that it gives you are more negative kinds of things. You know, like hit, kick, and crash. You know, and certainly those are not things we're going to do to people. We're, we're not, you know, kicking people saying, God bless your brother, here's a kick to the face. Well, not all of us. Some of us might be. But it wouldn't be very nice. We might make an impact that way. <laughs> but, and, and if something might change too, right? Your face might get rearranged. But that's, that's not what we mean by impact. But that aside, what we do mean is no less violent. That's because the impact that we're speaking of, it's one that the Holy Spirit uh, makes rending our hearts, opening our hearts up to conviction for sin, by which there can be a choice made to repent and receive Jesus. There can be no true change without repentance. And turning away from sin and toward the Lord, that's not something anyone can do apart from God. The first law of motion, 
It says that everything continues in a state, state of rest, the state that it's in, unless it is compelled to change by forces impressed upon it. So again, new information, when it's received, can inspire people to change. I think of when I was living in North Carolina and I used to do a lot of hospital visits. Um, don't do quite as many today as I used to, um, but you know that, was, that church was that over a thousand members, and so I got to the hospital quite a bit being the assisting pastor. Well, I, I was always surprised whenever I went in and out, of, out of a hospital because as a chaplain, we could use doors that other people didn't necessarily use going in and out of the, the hospital. And I would a lot of times end up walking out of a door that was obviously the break area for the nurses. And I, I was always surprised when I would walk out and I would find the nurses smoking. And so I'd be like, wait, don't, don't you guys, aren't you guys like caring for people that are dying because they smoked? So how then can you come out here, not to mention, some of these ladies are probably people that, that criticize you know, patients because they smoked. They couldn't stop smoking. You know, and yet they would go out here on their break and they would smoke a cigarette. Do you guys realize that tobacco was actually once considered to be a cure for cancer? Yeah. New information, right? New information changed our understanding of tobacco. You know, who, who would have thought inhaling smoke into your lungs was bad, right? <laughs> it makes sense, but, you know, we do some things sometimes that don't make sense. We rationalize it out and we reason it out because, we, because it makes us feel good, because we, we like it and we want to hang on to it, right? Sin, like cigarettes, it may be pleasurable for a while, but it's with full knowledge of the truth that people keep smoking until that cancer that comes from smoking cigarettes kills them. But in some cases, there is the realization that those things are killing you, and if you don't change your mind about them, then you will perish by them. Some people will change when they see the light. Others change only when they feel the heat. Many more still refuse to change, no matter the importance of doing so. Same thing with the Gospel. But in the case of the Gospel, the Bible tells us that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. You know, Jesus said that no one comes to Him unless the Father draws Him. The goal for all Christians is to serve the Lord and be pleasing to Him. And when we do that, the light of our lives becomes the evidence of Christ to the world. Exposing darkness. So that the things of the darkness turn to the light, which is Christ Jesus the Lord. I believe I can say without hesitation that no one here this morning is content with the world as it is. And we shouldn't be. If we are, then there's a problem. And of course, many Christians have cocooned themselves in comfort so they don't see the real problems of the world. Still others like the idea of being a Christian as long as it means that they don't have to change themselves. To an extent, much of what is church these days caters to either the cocoon of comfort and ignorance, or the cocoon of satisfaction and gratification of self. There was a man that was in the emergency room. He had just been roused back to consciousness. He asked the nurse how he had gotten there, and the nurse said, well, we wanted to ask you the same thing. The police said they found you passed out outside of an RV. And I said, well, wow, I really don't remember what was going on. She said, outside of that RV with you on the ground was a tube and raw sewage. He said, well, that, wow, that's interesting. I wonder how that could have happened. She said, well, the police think that you had gone into the RV park to try and siphon gas. And you got the wrong tank. (laughs) 
I went to a, a fair one time. Um, I can't remember how long ago it's been. And RVs have probably gotten a lot fancier since then. But I went to a fair one time and they had a whole setup of RVs out there that you could walk into and, and, and look at the beautiful interiors and all that. And there were some really, really nice ones. I mean, really nice ones. Like, you, you're not, your home is basically the RV. You'd, everything you could need. Television, uh, internet, um, running water, hot and cold running water, uh, stove, refrigerator, everything you can imagine that you might need is in that. But the funny thing is that people who buy motorhomes and RVs, you know what they do that for? Because they want to go see new places. They want to get out into the world. But then they deck out the very thing they take, they, they drive to these places, they deck it out just like the world they're leaving behind. So basically, they're just taking what they left behind with them. And, and so there's not really a change. How odd it is to, to say, hey, I want to go out, we're going to go out camping, we're going to rough it in this RV with everything we could ever possibly need. You know, so nothing really changes. Just stays the same. They may drive to a new place. They may set themselves in some new surrounding, but the newness goes unnoticed because we've carried along our old setting. The adventure of new life in Christ begins when the comfort patterns of the old life are left behind. Those who have received Jesus as their Lord and their Savior have new life, but often fail to embrace it. Living their Christian adventure encapsulated in what is perceived as a safe, yet really is not, place for them to go about their new life in Christ. They just cling to old things. For many, the idea of new life is frightening because of all the things that would be left behind. Many of those things may be gladly left behind. I know there were some things when, when I received Christ Jesus as my Lord and my Savior, there were some things I had no problem leaving behind. There were other things I had really hard problems leaving behind. Some of those things were what we might term disposable. You know, it didn't really matter that I left them behind. Some of those things were not what I would ever want to refer to as disposable, yet I also had to separate myself off from them, um, including friends. That's never an easy thing. But, you know, we can't have it both ways. The Holy Spirit will not allow us to ride the fence you know, without His convicting us toward righteousness. There's a cost to following Jesus. He warned us about that cost. In Luke 14, Jesus said that the cost of being His disciple should be counted so that we go into it knowing that anything worthwhile has a price to be paid. Jesus paid for us, paid a very high price, shed His blood for us, died on the cross. We likewise enter into that saving relationship through many tears. Watchman Nee, a man who spent a great deal of time in prison, yet he had a very interesting view of what the Christian life should be like. He said to keep our hand on the plow while wiping away our tears, that is Christianity. Perhaps the greatest hindrance to Christians really pressing in to following Jesus is the necessity of loss. Paul said for for. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. You know, I'm here to tell you this morning that, that any loss 
from following Jesus pales in comparison to the future of those who willingly do. The ground is hard. The plow is set. Every step forward is demanding. But the crop is satisfying beyond measure. There's not one step that you will take in following Jesus that He will not see and reward. But if we are to plow ahead, we cannot remain immature. But we must grow in Christ. And as we do so, we will see our world impacted and changed. And we will be used of God as participants in a great harvest. Now today, we're going to narrow the scope a bit and talk more about personal change and growing pains. Um, Not the television show Growing Pains, mind you. But the kind of growing pains that the Christian experiences as the Lord trims those things off of our lives that, that don't belong. That's the kind of growing pains we're talking about. You know, kids get leg pains as they're growing. That's something as an adult I had forgotten about until you know having my own kids. And then hearing them complain about their legs aching, like, ah, you're going to be, you know, six foot one tomorrow. They grow so fast. You know, it's much easier to, to talk about changes that need to be made elsewhere than with yourself. And when we do that, when we think, when we think of changes that, that we need to make to ourselves, we can tend to think of those things and then set them aside saying, okay, eventually we'll get there. Instead of plowing forward into those things. God says that that which is internal, that is what needs to change. Because it's what is inside that corrupts, not what is outside. The world, the world can go to hell in a handbasket, right? Yet we could not blame our participation in the immorality of the world on the world. Because it's what's inside of us. What's inside of us gave birth to the sin of participation. Today's teaching is very, very important. We're not going to make it through this whole chapter. Nonetheless, today's teaching is very, very important. And I want you to intentionally pay special attention because what's going to happen is we talk about trimming as the Lord, we talk about the Lord trimming things off of us, as we talk about being refined, what's going to happen is our flesh, which doesn't like that kind of talk, is going to want us to be distracted, to not pay attention. And so we need to make an extra special effort to pay attention this morning. Anytime we talk about pruning, refining, and change, we're going to have to make extra special attention. Today's teaching, we're going to discover five elements of Christian growth. Accountability. Encouragement. Companionship. Hope. And comfort. If we pursue these things and apply these things, then we will see ourselves grow and we will grow in our ability to impact our worlds for change. Now, last week, we finished out the second half of chapter 19. In that chapter, we saw how the Gospel was impacting the people of Ephesus. People were being healed. People were getting rid of their idols. People were, were, had, were stopping going to the temple to worship Artemis and, and, or Diana, whichever the, those names are kind of interchangeable. People's lives were changing dramatically. And that, we found out, it wasn't limited to Ephesus. The people who were complaining about these changes that were happening, they said that all of Asia was changing like this. The Gospel was having a massive effect on the whole area. Paul had gone to Ephesus there, and he had spent more time there in Ephesus than at any other city that he visited. 
In fact, he even taught for years at the school of Tyrannus there. Now, prior to his arrival in Ephesus, Paul had passed through all those churches that he had planted in Galatia. Starting out in Antioch, he traveled through Derby, through Iconium, Lystra, Antioch, uh, Antioch and Pergia, um, Laodicea. Then he came to Ephesus. Going through those churches, he collected to himself promising leaders, and brought them back to Ephesus, and then committed to teaching them and discipling them to training them hands-on. These men were like sons to him. Now certainly Paul loved everyone in the churches that he planted, as, as we should love and care for everyone. But Paul also had a special close group of companions who shared his heart and his zeal for pastoring and for discipleship. These men, they would prove to be very important for the church. Many of those churches that Paul planted, as he passed through them on this, his last missionary journey, this would be the last time these churches would see him. And so this group of men that he was training up would go to those churches, and they would be very important in the role of pastoring and leadership in those churches. This was a core group of men that Paul was training to take over those things that he was not going to be able to continue doing. So everything was changing. Asia, people were changing as they came to Christ, as the gospel spread around and people received Jesus. Things were changing. Habits were changing. Uh, immorality was changing. This remarkable, dramatic change that was occurring in Asia, was good, was, it wasn't good news to everyone. In particular, in Ephesus, the craftsmen who made and who sold those idols, the, the images of the shrine, or shrines of the Temple of Artemis, they made idols, talismans, other things. These people were being put out of business because Christians did not buy those things. And so a lot of people were becoming Christians and were no longer purchasing those things from the silversmiths and the other people of similar occupations. That was interesting. I love when, I, when I'm reading through chapter 19 and it calls them the workers of similar occupation. I always think that's some kind of Monty Python skit. They were, it was like a union or a guild of people that, that cooperated together and... and uh, were dependent on one another in, in regards to the manufacture of these things and the selling of these things. So they were very concerned and upset at people abandoning these things. Those new Christians, they weren't going to be a customer anymore. So they started to, to try to rile things up. They started uh, shouting that the Christians were a threat to their false god Diana and even a threat to the very temple itself. You see, at that time, being a Christian didn't mean buying trinkets with scriptures written on them, purchasing paintings of Jesus in, in you know, purple sashes, filling the bookshelves with, with home improvement books, purchasing religious items was something that the pagans did. So Christians were saving money. <laughs> they no longer needed to purchase those things. And so with receiving Jesus, the makers of the idols, they were watching their income diminish and vanish but the general population of Ephesus they weren't going to riot just on the accounts of these silversmiths who were now losing money so what they had to do these guys had to start a religious riot and so they said that the temple the goddess Artemis and that all of Ephesus everything that they were famous for was going to be brought to nothing by these Christians and that of course did it the crowds riled up they rushed into the theater and they took with them uh, Gaius and, and uh, what was his name, Aristarchus. They were, they were Christians. They, they took them with them into the, uh, the, the uh, theater or stadium. These guys have been companions of Paul. And the situation was really out of hand. The lives of Gaius and, and, and Aristarchus, they were definitely threatened. Paul was on the outside of this, and it, this was apparently a very loud, very noisy riot going on inside this theater, and Paul was on the outside, and he could hear what was going on. The city attorney, 
piped up, however, warned the crowds that, that Rome was going to take notice and they would come in and they would stop this riot by force if they did not stop themselves. If there was a legal issue they wanted to take up with the Christians, they should do, through, do so through regular channels. And with that, the riot was, was dispersed and those guys, Gaius and Aristarchus, were freed. And that's where we pick it up now with verse 1 of chapter 20. It says, Until After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now, prior to this, in, in chapter 19, Luke, the author of Acts here, Luke had, had used the phrase, uh, or he had called the riot a, a, what was the words he used? A commotion or a disturbance. Um, if Luke was fond of using understatement. Now, he used understatement to really kind of overstate things, in fact. So the riot that the, those silversmiths had started, um, they were putting the friends of Paul, Paul's companions, they're putting their lives in great jeopardy. And the commotion that was going on in the theater, it was so great that Paul on the outside, he was hearing it, and, and he wanted to go in. He wanted to defend his friends. But he couldn't. His, his friends would not let him go in to defend them. You know, friends stand up for friends. Friends also keep friends from making dumb and rash decisions. And the first of the five elements of growth is friendship and accountability. I know I said accountability earlier is, is just that first one, but we're going to throw in friendship with that first one. That counts as one, friendship and accountability. You know, accountability is not something that comes easily. easily. It requires a, a great deal of humility. The, the ability to submit yourself to the responsibility of others. It's the acceptance of obligation to give account of one's actions. And even to receive correction. And to do that with thanksgiving. That is accountability. The, the with thanksgiving part is important because you know, prickly friends, they have hands-off relationships. You know, people feel like they have to tiptoe around them and because people don't feel like they can hold them accountable without them pouting or, or, or uh, clamming up about it, they stop holding them accountable, and so as Christians, they don't grow. Paul embraced friendship. He embraced companionship. And he did that wherever he went. We know that he was concerned about others because of the way that the things that we see written in the letters, his, his letters that we have here in our New Testament, the way that he talked about others, even reprimanding others for certain things that they had done. Paul definitely cared about people. Paul knew also that he was in a dangerous situation going into some of these cities where the immorality was just to an extent that we probably wouldn't even understand it. And he would, he actually took a Nazarite vow. You guys may remember us talking about this. He took a Nazarite vow when he went to Corinth. Corinth was a, a really, really tough place um, being a, a, a hub of, uh, of travel back and forth through there and export, import, trade. And so, you know, when you get a bunch of sailors <laughs> in a city, you know, things can get kind of rough in that city. There was also um, a temple on a, an Acropolis there in Corinth. And um, priestesses would, would come down from that temple and, and they were basically prostitute priestesses and they would come down. and um, So there would be great temptation there in Corinth. And Paul, knowing this, he had taken a Nazarite vow while he was there. And that Nazarite vow, part of it is you're, you're leaving your hair growing long. Um, and perhaps that was a reminder to him that he's taken this vow that he's going to press into God and he's not going to allow 
um, these things that are going on around him to, to uh, affect him or to cause him to stumble, to tempt, tempt him into stumbling. Paul also confronted friends that he saw were making uh, concessions. And he, was, he was always willing to, to confront people over concessions they were making. He had no qualms about that. You know, and if, if this friendship accountability thing, if it really wasn't that important to Paul, he probably would have traveled alone. He probably could have, and frankly, in a lot of instances, he probably would have done a lot better <laughs> had he traveled along. Because sometimes the people he brought with him kind of held him back. But at the same time, he knew that he needed brothers to hold him accountable, companions to travel with him. And we, we also, all of us here, we need brothers and sisters in Christ. We need one another. You know, here together we're a family, a strange patchwork family, but we're a family nonetheless, right? I receive from you, you receive from me. There's none in this family who is greater. We all have our special place in this body, submitted to the head who is Jesus. We play a part in the refining process of others. We play a part in that pruning process of one another. That's a role that we really have to give one another permission for. Right? If we are, again, prickly about other people confronting us over things or, or telling us we could do better about certain things, if we're prickly about that, then people are just going to quit telling us and we're just going to continue the way we are and we're not going to change. So we have to have that kind of back and forth with one another. We have to have that relationship where we're willing to receive from one another. Even when it's a difficult comment or a difficult observation. We've got to have that. If we don't, we're not going to grow together. When the uproar of that riot had ceased, Paul gathered his Christian brother and sisters together and he embraced them. If you want to grow and embrace friendship. Embrace your friends. Let them in your life. Tell them how much they mean to you. Tell them how much you need them. You can't do it without them. We need each other. Verse 2. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. All right, so Paul was, was now headed from Ephesus to Macedonia and then into Greece. He went back through Philippi. He went through uh, Berea, through Thessalonica, among some other places as well. And there he saw that the church was being persecuted. So Paul was going along and he was encouraging them. And each place that he went, he encouraged the believers in the church with, it says, many words. The Greek word for encourage, it, it, as is the case with, with many Hebrew as well as Greek words, it has a broader meaning than, than what our typical English word might have. Paul didn't go there just to shoot the breeze and then leave, you know. He warned, and he consoled, and he urged, and he encouraged. The first of these four elements of growth, friendship and accountability, the second is encouragement. Encouragement. But understand that encouragement is not just you know, high fives and fist bumps. No, it's much more than that. It's exhortation and admonishment. It's to champion and advocate for. It's to, to comfort and to bless. To restore and to refresh. But let me tell you, if it's easy to do, if you don't have to push yourself to do it, then it's probably not encouragement. 
you know, encouraging someone else is hard to do. It really is. I mean, it's not something that typically comes natural to a person. There's people that have a gift, a spiritual gift of encouraging others, no doubt. But for most people, it's hard to, to take that moment to, to say, man, you did a, an awesome job with that. That was really fantastic. Or to say, hey, you know what? You really could have done that better. But that is so important if we are to grow in Christ. If we're to grow together as a family, we need to be willing to do that. Exhortation and admonishment. But let me tell you, encouragement is like what I like to call spiritual jazz. All right? I'm not a big fan of jazz music. It, to me, it's kind of hard to keep up with. It's a lot of different things that seem to be mashed together, and sometimes it doesn't really make sense altogether, you know? And, and with my background in music, man, I'm more rock and I'm more this, that, you know, and you got the 4 4 beat, you got, you got the very simple things that kind of merge together, and they all fit together for the most part. But with jazz, man, it it's, it's sometimes seems just so random and, and so hard to understand. It's unexpected. You know, it, it's offbeat. It, it, sometimes it's uncomfortable. You listen to jazz music, man, sometimes you just feel really uncomfortable listening to it. Sometimes, from my point of view, sometimes it hurts to listen to jazz. Sometimes it really hurts. But you know what? Those times when I, I have taken the time to actually listen to it. And for me, jazz music, I kind of I endure it more than listen to it. I find that, that just musically, I've been challenged by it. And that's a good thing. You know, if we, if we um, are put our, putting ourselves in situations all the time where we're not challenged by them, where we're, we're doing only what we're really good at, then we're not being motivated to grow. So encouragement is spiritual jazz. It stimulates growth. What it doesn't do, though, is leave you the same as you were. You know, it's not, it's not the, the Joel Olstein's message of, hey kid, you're great, and, and, and gosh darn it, people love you. You know, it's not that. There's a place for that. There's a trash can right over there. There's a place for that. I learned um, playing music. Um, I, I learned that it's the people who actually really care about you are the people who say, you're out of tune. <laughs> or, or those lyrics, really bad. You know, or, or oh, there's a million different things. People who are willing to, to tell you what you didn't want to hear. You know, those were the people that actually cared. The people that wanted to see you improve. It, it was the ones, you know, when you're playing at the club, it was the ones who came up to you afterwards and said, Oh, you're great. You know, I'm, I'm my brother is so and so in the music industry. And those are the people that they just, they had too much to drink and they really don't care about you. When someone says, You know, you might consider doing this rather than that. That person's being a friend. That person's caring. You know, there, there are some places, some churches you'll go into where you just you go in one way and you leave that same way. You haven't been challenged the whole time you were there. There was no provocation to press into the Lord. Not here. I, I'm not going to allow that. We're going to be committed always to declaring the the whole counsel of God. Hebrews 10.24 says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as, the, as you see the day approaching. Pruning is very important to shrubbery. You clip off the dead things, the things that are preventing growth. Not only does the shrub look better, 
but it grows better. But if a Christian is, instead of being like a regular shrub like you would see in a garden, if a Christian is being like rubbery shrubbery, you know, and you're trying to put the shears to it, and the shears are just bouncing off of it, you can't clip anything off, that Christian is not going to grow. You got to allow those things to be trimmed. If you're wise in your own eyes, then chances are you're not going to allow those things to be trimmed off of you, and you're going to look like a dying bush and you're not going to grow. Encouragement is iron sharpening iron. It's sparks flying. It's pieces falling to the ground. It's at times painful. At times frustrating. Many times it's heart rending. It may even be heartbreaking. But you know what? We come out of it better able to magnify and serve the Lord. It's... It's the revival of of an edge that had grown dull from use. Paul, he had planted these churches, all these churches that he was visiting. He had planted these churches, and in many ways, he was a spiritual father to these churches. And so, you know, when he returned, when he was making this, this circuit back around visiting these churches, they would have been they would have been packed like a Baptist church that was all back rows, right? They would have been packed out. You know, the, the father of the church was there. <laughs> no offense to you guys in the back row. They, these guys, they wanted to learn from him. They were hungry for what he had to say. But you know what? He needed them too. He very much needed them. More often than not, Paul's life was in danger. And as as we saw before, he was well known among those who opposed Christ. Even even the demons, you guys remember that, even the demons knew who Paul was, knew who Jesus was. Paul needed encouragement too. There's not a single one here this morning in this room that doesn't need encouragement. Encouragement. And we shouldn't overlook that. You know, the, the hug, the handshake, the fist bump, the, the, those things are all valid too. There's nothing wrong with those things. You know, the sharing in responsibilities, quick words of encouragement. You know, Christ loves you, Christ died for you. Uh, look up, look at your hope, man. You know, it, when, when you. When you build one another up, the church is built up. But we also, again, we, we also play that pruning role in one another, another's lives. And, and we, again, need to have that with one another where we can do that. Where we can say the hard word and we know that the other person is not going to walk away in a huff if we want to grow. Verse 4, And so Patar of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and Tychicus, and Gaius, did I say that? Yeah, and, Tro- and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, I think that's in South Alabama, where we stayed seven days. No, I'm sorry, that's Troy that's in South Alabama. Paul, he was not a one man show. You know, we can get the impression that that all of this was Paul. Yes, he was very much a part of all of it, very much a leader. But he could not have done all these things alone. And he, of course, relied on the Lord. And he relied on co-workers in the ministry. A very important part of encouragement is we. You guys cannot imagine how much it blesses me when I I hear people that, that come to the church here and they refer to the church as theirs. 
Or, you know, they're, they're talking about something that we're going to do and they use the word we. You know, for the longest time, starting out planning the church, you know, the, it, you would always hear people would say, uh, what's your church going to be doing? You know, people who came would say, <laughs> say that, what's your church going to be doing? Or, you know, it, just using that, that thing, that, that, those words that kind of let you know, well, they hadn't really, uh, they were not considering themselves really a part of the church yet. But, man, I love it when I hear people say we in that. Because, for one thing, I know I'm not alone in this when people say we, you know. I feel like, hey, I've, you know, i got brothers and sisters in Christ that are, are locked arms here with me. You know, and we're doing this together. It's, it's not just me. And those, those little things like that, they mean a whole lot. The people that, that come in, you know, when, when we have guests, during the summer, things tone down, people are out busy, what have you. But, you know, once, once school gets back in and things kick back up, people start going around, start investigating what church we want to go to, people that have newly moved to the area. And, and you know, we is very important to them as well. You know, and that's something that I, I've been watching around and, and kind of seeing how we do things here, you know, and because I, I didn't start everything here, you know, some things started, other people started doing things, I was like, awesome, glad somebody's doing that, they saw something there and they started doing it, that's great, you know, but I, I look around and I watch and I try and think, well, how can, how can we do this better, you know, how can we improve on this, and uh, one of those things is, is just watching how new people when they come in, you know, how how they're made to feel apart as opposed to, to you know, coming in and just sitting down alone and, and waiting for things to, to begin. You know, and an important part of that is, you know, us just taking the time to, to go ahead and get things done, maybe even getting here early in the morning, get things done ahead of time so that we can come back here into the, the, the sanctuary area and when new people walk in, we can immediately just start talking to them. You know, that makes them feel like they are part, that, that this is we, this is family, you know. I want them to see that sign come in that says, welcome home. You know, and not feel like they're walking into a, a home that is, has nobody in it. <laughs> it's an empty home. You know, and it means a, we means a whole lot to people that are visiting. We means a whole lot to this whole church body. You know, when, when we talk about how we are going to do things, what we are doing, what the Lord is doing through us, when we say these things and use this terminology, we also encourage one another and we build up this body together. Paul called the brethren together here. He embraced them. He encouraged them. And they continued on as a team. You know, we're a team here. You know, it's, not, it's not me, it's not you, it's us. It's all of us. And you know, Whereas I, I may cast a vision, I may uh, lead at the same time, I'm not like the person that's uh, you know above everybody else. I'm with you guys. I'm down there with you, and I'm the same as all of you. And we're all just trying to to please and magnify the Lord together, the best we can. Verse seven says, "Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight." Now Troas, you probably saw it on the map earlier, but Troas is, is just a, it's a land's journey to the north of Ephesus, and from Philippi it's across the Aegean. Now the team, Paul and the gang here, on, they're, they're gathered together on Sunday, the first day of the week. That was their habit to do, and they broke bread together. This is, this is the first, well, yeah, I think this is the first uh, mention here of the, the early church meeting together on a Sunday. Um, they met in the evening, though, here. And that's because Sunday, I remember Sunday to these guys was a work day. Saturday would have been the, the Sabbath, the Shabbat, the day of rest. So they're, they're meeting on a night after everybody's finished work, finished whatever their occupation was. And they're partaking of supper together. And we might call this koinonia. Now, koinonia is a Greek word for t participation on an intimate level. Our koinonia with one another is based on our common koinonia with Jesus. And it's from our love of Jesus that our agreement in service comes forth. Each one of us have different issues. Um, some of us may be angry. Some of us, um, and perhaps we hide it well. Maybe we're angry we just hide it really well. 
Um, Some of us may be frustrated and we hide it. Some of us may be bitter and we hide it. Others may be joyful, cheerful, enthusiastic about life. Some of us hide that too. You know? Some of us are on a spiritual mountaintop. We feel like God has is, is been speaking to us today and He's speaking to us every day and we're just great. You know, spiritually, we're on that mountaintop. So others of us feel like we're just walking through a dark valley and, and, and God is somewhere, has, has separated Himself from us. You know, we think of the green pastures that Jesus used to lead us to and we wonder, why, Lord, have You led me into this valley? There's no fields here. The fields are gone. The, the, there's no streams. Where's the, the green grasses, the, the cool waters? But the Bible says that Jesus leads us to both places. Leads us to those green fields, to the cool waters. Leads us to the valley of the shadow of death. He's our shepherd for whichever place we're in. That hasn't changed. He pl- his plans for us are good everywhere that He leads us. There's purpose in every place that He leads us. We are blessed in every place that He brings us. We grow in God in every place that He puts us. And it's in the valley that we have the opportunity to minister to the multitudes. Very few people are on the mountaintops. The majority of people are in the spiritual valleys. And so we have that opportunity then when we're there to minister to the majority of people. But it is a difficult place. I know that. I know it's a difficult place. I'm there a lot. I don't talk about it a lot, but I am there a lot. I know you guys wind up there a lot too. Someone once said, one can endure sorrow alone, but it takes two to be glad. I can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. We need each other. The next of the five elements of Christian growth is companionship. We share a common bond through faith in Christ. The koinonia, the the oneness of the body of Christ. We must commit ourselves to those things that God tells us go along with that bond. What are those things? Well, first, we have a responsibility to consider one another. How our actions or words might affect one another. Are we inspiring one another? And what are we inspiring one another to? Is it love and good works or is it temptation? Secondly, we have a responsibility to forgive one another. I don't know about you, but I can make mistakes. Sometimes I make mistakes that hurt other people. We must be willing to ask forgiveness. We must be willing to give forgiveness. We must be willing to receive forgiveness. And finally, we have a responsibility to serve one another. You know, fellowship is not just hanging out, having you know, witty conversations. Fellowship happens when leaders serve and servants lead. Romans 12, starting with verse 9, it says, Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. There's a difference in the communion of the world and the communion that we share together in Christ. The world feeds on one another. We don't have to look far to see that vindictive pattern in the world, to see the backbiting, the hate, the, the hurtful sarcasm. But Christians feed off of one another. Like coals in a fire. The heat of, of one preserves the heat of the other. 
remember a story that my pastor used to tell. I guess he still tells it. He's not dead or anything. <laughs> he probably still tells it. But for all, for all purposes, he used to tell it. And uh, it was a story of a, a pastor that went to visit a congregation member that hadn't been around in a few months. And he went and visited this man at his house. And he found the man sitting alone in his living room. And he was sitting in front of a fire. Hopefully he didn't have rivets in his pants. And, and he sat down, the pastor sat down beside him and asked how he was doing and why he hadn't been at church. And the, the man said, well, you know, I, I kind of come to, come to discover that I can worship God wherever I am. I can go out into the woods and I can worship God. I can stay here at home and I can worship God. I can worship God wherever I am. And the pastor took the, uh, the stoking, the, the stick that you stoke a fire with. I can't think of the word for that. He picked that up and he pulled one of the hot coals out of the fire there onto the bricks. And, and they just sat there and they watched as that hot coal started cooling off and finally it just became dark black. And the man turned to him and said, I'll be there next Sunday. And that's, that was the point. You know, when we separate ourselves away, we, we lose our fire. We lose that passion and that zeal. When we, may, when we are intentional about coming together, not only do we preserve the, the burning and the fire in one another, but we also amplify it. Put a bunch of coals together and you have a much hotter fire than just one or two coals burning by themselves. So these people, these were the guys that were all gathered together and Paul was speaking to them and his message went on till midnight. My messages are actually quite short, right? Midnight. Verse 8. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together and in a window, <laughs> in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep he was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now, maybe it was all the lamps that were in the room that were burning, or, or maybe it was the, the people that were crowded together in that room, or maybe he was just you know, hoping that being in the window would help to keep him awake. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but whatever the case, the window was three stories up. It was probably the second time that Paul had said, and in closing, and being late at night, he fell asleep and fell out the window. And that boy's name, Eutychus, it means well-fated. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> but he was found dead. They went down to investigate what happened. And they found him dead. Now, I've told a few jokes during service that have died. I have yet to have anybody die during service. So, does that mean that I'm a more interesting teacher than Paul? No, we just, our windows are sealed, sealed right? <laughs> you can't fall out. So one might imagine this young man's death. It put a real damper on the meeting, on the meeting didn't it? Paul rushed down to that young man. He stretched himself out across him and he embraced him. Then by faith, pronounced that God was going to bring him back to life. This is where it really gets kind of wild here though. Paul says don't worry. Why? Because he knew what God could do. That fourth element of Christian growth is hope. Paul had been in prison and, and saw the doors open. He had been in chains and saw them removed. He had been enslaved and he had been made free. Sometimes we need to be reminded that through Christ, we have gained access by faith into His, this wonderful grace in which we all now stand. And we can thus rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. God is your protector. He's your provider. He's your comforter. He's your hope. All people have hope to some degree. It's a psychological necessity for man to keep going. 
In fact, even when there's no, no rational grounds for it, people still continue to hope. But the hope of the unsaved has no object. It's just wind and vapor. That which comes and goes and has no true basis. Survives on platitudes and temporary outcomes. The hope of the saved, however, is founded on the bedrock of faith that is evidence of those things hoped for. In other words, it is hope founded on truth. And we remind one another of that hope. Verse 11 says, Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten, and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. So, probably to our surprise here, Paul, having made this declaration, he went back up to the room, ate, and then continued on preaching until daybreak. And then we find out that this, this Eutychus, he's again alive, and the church was, of course, greatly comforted by that. That's the fifth element of Christian growth, is comfort. The kind of comfort that this congregation received was a mix of peace, tranquility, and conviction. A mix that is hard to describe. It comes from the revelation of God's care. The church of that day endured persecution. They had trials, but they had entrusted and turned over their lives to the Lord. And so they had great comfort. True comfort comes from the knowledge of the knowledge of an obedient obedience to the Lord. We remind each other of that comfort when we're together. We're able to share in that comfort together. You know, it's amazing. And in all the time that I've done pastoral care, I came to learn that it didn't matter what words I came with. It didn't matter a whole lot to them what I said. It was just me being available to listen. That is what made the most difference to the people that I would visit. Just being there. Just being a presence there with them. The author of Hebrews wrote that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Our gathering together is not something that's optional to a Christian. It's a matter of life and death. And you may be overcome. You may be overcome by sleep during the message. You know, maybe I'll start blowing an air horn every once in a while just randomly. <laughs> Actually, that would be fun. But you know, if we if we forsake assembling then we could be overcome by much more than sleep. We could be overcome by Satan. There are a lot of Christians today who are comatose, who neglect assembling together. And as they have done that over the days, the months, the years, they've not received the comfort that they needed when they needed it. And so they've become callous then to the true doctrines of Scripture. And being out of the battle, the battle has just advanced beyond them, leaving them on the wrong side of the battle line. There, there are important things that happen when we assemble together. We, we've talked about these five of these things this morning. But we're going to tie these things together here in our final verses, starting with verse 13. It says, Then we went ahead to the ship and sailed to Assos, where intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. But when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. Wow. We sailed from there, and the next day came to Chios, the following day we arrived at Samos and stayed at 
Trogillium. The next day we came to Malatos, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he could not have so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Guys, we need each other. And we find again here those words of togetherness and teamwork. He met us. We took Him. We sailed. We arrived. We came. Paul, he was dependent on other believers and other believers were dependent on him. But if we leave it at only that, then we leave out the ties that bring this all together. And those ties are this. It's never about me. It's always about you. If I'm taking care of you, who's taking care of me? If you're taking care of me, who's taking care of you? We're taking care of one another. It's about consideration of others above ourselves. It's about a body which functions best when all members are attached. It's about everyone being held accountable in friendship, encouraging one another by our companionship, reminding each other of our comfort, of our confident hope. To me, it's not what I need, it's what you need. To you, it's not what you need, it's what we all need. It's a well-toned body that, that moves with purpose and that glorifies God in all it does. We'll close there. Let's pray. Lord, Father, we thank You for this morning and we place ourselves before You and ask, Lord, that these things that we've heard this morning, perhaps some of these things we had never considered before and perhaps some of these things we knew but had failed to see them manifest in our lives. Lord, I pray that we would be intentional about these things. Lord, that we wouldn't just hear these things and walk out of here thinking that they were really nice, but never do anything with them. Lord, I pray that we would not have to tiptoe around one another, that we would be welcoming when another brother or sister comes to us and tells us that something might work better if we were to change this or that, or, or that there's something in our life that, that just doesn't equate with following Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would have that kind of body of Christ relationship with one another. And that, Father, ultimately, You would be glorified and magnified Lord, we give You this week. We place ourselves again before You and we ask that You would just use us however You wish. Give us many opportunities to be salt and light in this world. Father, I pray that we would open our mouths when You would have us open them, that we would keep them closed when You would have us keep them closed. Lord, we love You. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face and His light to shine upon you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace, His shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, this Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and everyone said, Amen. Thank you for listening. Remember to be a doer of the Bible and not just a hearer. That means demonstrating God's love to others as He has so abundantly poured out His love into your life. Most importantly, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? It's the most important decision you could ever make. 
Choose your destiny. Don't let the world choose it for you. The Bible says that everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Go to calvarybirmingham.com and click on God to learn more about God's plan for your life. If you pray to receive Jesus through this podcast, please let us know. Go to calvarybirmingham.com and click on contact. While you are there, please consider sowing into this ministry by clicking on donate.